weight on all these older generations that Trumpism has infected that party and it's going to take at least a decade, if not a lifetime, to exercise it. You know, and, and I do not see Larry Hogan, I don't see Charlie <laughs> Baker coming in and taking right. the reins of that party. I just don't. I'm it's sorry. The Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Welcome to this Washington Post Live subscriber exclusive interview co-produced with the Capehart podcast with Liz Smith. Smith is a veteran Democratic political strategist who's been linked to some of the top Democratic lawmakers in the past decade. Most recently, former presidential candidate and current Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. On July 19th, her memoir hit the bookshelves. It's called Any Given Tuesday, A Political Love Story, and it offers an honest guide to modern day political campaigning. Uh, we'll talk all about it and get her thoughts on the state of our politics in 2022, as well as 2024, um, as we get closer to the midterm elections. So with that, Liz Smith, welcome to Washington Post Live. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan, good to be here with you. Good, good to see you. Um, I'm going to save all of the political crystal balling questions that I have until a little bit later. It's a, it's a luxury for me to have 50, 5 oh minutes um, with a guest. So I'm going to take advantage of it. And let's start talking about your book, Any Given Tuesday. Why the title? Um, so uh, throughout the book, I weave in my love of professional football. Um, it was something that tied me very closely with my dad, who I also, who, who I devoted my book to, and I speak um, a lot about in my book. But there's a saying in football, um, any given Sunday, and what it gets to is that any given Sunday, the worst team in the league can beat the best team in the league. Any given Sunday... The uh, best team in the league can lose to the worst team in the league. And what it takes, you know, to make a great team is an element of belief that, you know, your losses don't define you, your wins don't define you. And that's a lot of how I think about politics. And that's a lot of what I write in this book, um, because this book isn't just about you know, all the campaigns I've been on that have been successful and have gone, you know, smashingly well. It's also about lessons I learned from losses, um, mistakes I made, but how time after time, um, I guess now 20 times, um, I uh, picked myself up and and went to the next Tuesday to compete again. And um, so I thought that the it, it tied together sort of all these dif disparate threads in my book um, very well and captured, you know, sort of what I believe um, to be a fundamental thing of, about politics, which is that you do need a, an element of belief. Um, you need to believe in the power of what you're doing and the importance of what you're doing um, to continue to, to, to work in such a bruising business. All right. So since you brought it up, lessons learned, mistakes made. So um, give me give me a couple of lessons learned that you write yeah. about in the book. Um, well, one lesson uh, I talk about um, with the Pete campaign, for instance, is the importance of of communi communicating and meeting people where they are. Uh, one one of the reasons why Pete was able to take off um, in the way that he did when no one, no one expected him to. And I will give you credit, Jonathan. You did speak to him very, very early. I think in January 2019. No, no December, December 2018. 2018. 
December 2018, when um, he was not, and I mean, my God, that in January 2019, he wasn't even being listed on any of the right. you know, New, New York Times lists for presidential candidates or anything like that. So I remember sitting in that office with you um, when you were doing that podcast, but you were one of very few journalists who saw the sort of potential in him um, and the special qualities he had. But um, one of the lessons I learned from that campaign was the importance of uh, a communicating effectively and communicating effectively through the media. Um, a lot of presidential campaigns these days still communicate like it's 2004 or 1994. You know, they just speak to the big publications. They just go on the Sunday shows. They do just sort of what you're expect, what you're, th what is thought to be sort of presidential in terms of communications. Now that that's great. That's all good and fine. And, you know, we love a good Washington Post interview, clearly, and we love a good Washington Post podcast. Um, but to reach voters effectively now, you have to understand that the media environment has completely changed and is completely fractured and that um, you're not just going to reach people by speaking to one newspaper, one, um, the evening news uh the big radio show, whatever it is, you really have to go everywhere. Um, and with Pete, we knew that he had no name ID. He had no money. His campaign email list was like 11,000 people, no joke. And to give you a sense of what that means, like most presidential campaign email lists are in the millions of people. Um, we realized that we had to use earned media, and that was the only way that we could get his message out there. So we put him everywhere. He he talked to everyone at the Washington Post, and he talked to the New York Times, and he did all those traditional things. But we also made sure that he was reaching sort of non-traditional audiences. We put him on Barstool Sports. We put him on TMZ. We put him on Fox News, a place where you don't see a lot of Democrats communicate. Now. And the Fox News thing is interesting, and I actually devote a fair amount of time in my book to talking about why Democrats should go on Fox News. Um, and you know, it, it gets to this lesson, but um, a lot of people are like, well, there are not a ton of Democrats who watch Fox News. That's, not, that's actually not really true. There are a fair number of Democrats who watch Fox News. But one thing that we've seen from Pete um, and that we learned from Pete's campaign is that when he did that first Fox Town Hall, over a million people tuned in, which was about six times as many people tune into a CNN town hall. But the secondary coverage was out of control because mm -hmm. then his Fox News town hall was then leading segments every hour on MSNBC, on CNN. It was picked up by People Magazine. It was picked up by the Washington Post. It was picked up by the New York Times. It was picked up by the New York Post. It was picked up by the Daily Mail. So everywhere you went, you could read about Pete being on Fox News. You didn't just have to tune into Fox News to see him on there. So it, I, I like to call it sort of, it was our going everywhere strategy, but it's mm -hmm. an understanding of the, the modern media environment that you really, um, that people, people's attention is more fractured than ever. And that to get it and to break through, you have to be willing to go to places, podcasts that, you, you know, that for West Wing addicts, podcasts um, <laughs> devoted to um, like basically anything you can think of, but that is how right. you break through. And we made it so that even if you wanted to, you couldn't avoid hearing about Pete Buttigieg. Right. Right. And, and we've gotten way down because I do want to come back and, and talk about then Mayor Pete. Um, but give me one, one um, mistake made that you write about. Um. <clears throat> Uh, so in general or like in, in general in life or in general in peace campaign, <laughs> no, no, there no. are a lot. In, in, no, 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 I know. In the book, in the book. In the Just book. give yeah. one of the mistakes made. Sure. Um, so I, you know, I devote my prologue and my second to last chapter to my time advising Governor Cuomo. I had consulted for him in 2018. Um, I had been a campaign consultant on his re-election campaign. You know, not that he really needed me. He romped in both the primary and the general election. In, um, you know, then, of course, we all know in 2020, he became a national and global phenomenon for his briefings, which were an, a refreshing contrast with 
um, you know, what we were seeing from Donald Trump um, in the White House. But then in early 2021, in um, February 2021, he was accused of sexual harassment by a former state employee. And he and his top advisors called me in to see if I would help give him advice. You know, I am someone, and I assume we'll get to this, who has been through um, her fair share of cri personal crises and um, crises surrounding my personal life and, um, uh, you know, my private life is how I put it. And so they wanted my advice um, on how he should handle it. And as I write in the book, it, the promise was, you know, just just call one or two calls, you know, famous last words. And <clears throat> I said yes, because I loved the governor. I trusted him. I considered him a friend. I considered him a mentor. Um, and sort of like and an ironic thing here is that um, I had gotten close to him during the 2020 campaign and I remember I was sitting in um, a hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire and he called me and he was the first person who ever told me that I should write a book. Now, I'm betting he's regretting that now, <laughs> but um, uh, so the mistake I made was I, so I went to advise him, I, I believed him, I trusted him 100%, but as time went on, you know, he, he said that nothing else would come out. Um, and there had never been so much as a whisper about any of this, any of this sort of conduct when he had been so governor. Let's, let when I've been, yeah. 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 Let me, let, let me stop you on that because I heard you, um, I, I listened to your, your interview on the Hive uh, podcast on Vanity Fair and you said the same thing that there was, you never heard a whisper of this sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember thinking, really? Yeah, really. Um, huh. You know, there had been, so he he was a single guy. He had gotten divorced in, um, I think, 2004. And he had been in a long-term relationship with Sandra Lee. And, you know, I, I'd known that he had been in, you know, relationships with women. But certainly I had never heard a whisper about anything involving sexual misconduct or sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was, this was news to me. And frankly, it was news to a lot of, I, I, I don't think I'm the only person that would say that. Um, it was news to a lot of people in the New York media, a lot of people in Albany as well. And Albany is a small town. I mean, Jonathan, yeah. you know how these, you know how these state capitals are. It's really hard to, to, um, to not know sort of everyone's business when, when you're in right. the state capital. And state capitals do often create this sort of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, do sort of take on the character of Sodom and Gomorrah because you're oftentimes in the middle of nowhere and it's a bunch of l lobbyists who are applying um, elected officials and young staffers with alcohol and, you know, all those dynamics. Um, yeah. But no, I had never heard a whisper of any sort of harassment or misconduct. Um, but then, sorry, my kid, one of my cats is a little bit focal. So if, you, if you, if you hear that's that, right, um, <laughs> that, that's my cat, Cersei. So, um, so I went to advise him and, and he, he swore, he looked us each in the eye when we met with him and he just said, nothing else will come out. There is nothing else that will come out. And then, you know, there was a steady sort of drip, 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 um, you know, things of varying degrees, um, as, as is often the case with these things. And um, I found myself in a situation that it felt like a little bit like quicksand, um, that I was like getting pulled in over my head and there was no way for me to get out. But I trusted him. You know, you have to understand this was something that I really did believe in. And so it was really hard for me to grapple with the fact um, that, uh, that maybe he, he wasn't being truthful to me, but there was another dynamic here, um, which you are also familiar with, um, having worked with a lot of people in politics is that politics is filled with a lot of soulless cut and run artists, people who are there, you know, right by your side at the press conference when everything is going gangbusters, but they disappear the second that there is a hint of trouble. And, um, you know, I have seen that dynamic up close. I've lived that dynamic myself. And it is very important to me to never be that person, to be the type of person who is there for you during your highs and during your lows. Um, but ultimately, it was by the time the AG report came out um, and uh, there were new allegations in there that he, a one week prior to the report dropping, 
had looked us all in the eye and said there was going to be nothing new in, even though he knew that it would be in there. Um, it was beyond clear to me that, you know, my loyalty had been abused. I felt, you know, I spoke with other, I've spoken with other female staffers and former staffers, advisors, that I felt like my gender had been weaponized and been used sort of to provide him cover um, as an advisor. I mean, I was really a behind the scenes advisor. I wasn't really going out in the press and talking that much to reporters. It was mostly helping to prep him for stuff. But I did still feel like my gender had been weaponized. And what I learned was that, um, I should never conflate, and in politics, this is a really important dynamic, I think, with staffers, which is that you shouldn't conflate loyalty with integrity. And you should be able to um, discern between earned loyalty and blind loyalty. And in my case, uh, I was employing blind loyalty. And it, mm -hmm. I wish I had listened to some of the alarm bells I'd heard along the way. I wish I'd seen some of the red flags, paid attention to some of the red flags I'd seen along the way but um i now i think i have a very different perspective and i have a better radar on things but i do hope that people one thing they take away is that people you love people you trust people who look you in the eye um will let you down and that you've got to sort of tr trust your gut and be willing to you know cut the cord with people even if if you feel like they're not being truthful with you mm -hmm. so uh, so on this liz because this raises a whole bunch of uncomfortable issues and questions especially um for someone like you uh, a democratic yeah. party operative um right. social uh, like a liberal on social issues right. You're you're a woman in a in a field where there are very few women at your you know in the game at your level. And you said a moment ago that you weren't out front. You were not an out front person doing television, but your text messages came out. Sure. From 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 that time, and one of them, um, uh, there's some text you messaged a group of Cuomo aides, and here's the quote. He's been sleeping with people he works with for decades. I've been told con consent when power is involved is complicated, as is flirtation. And also, yeah, it's good, but all depends on what else comes out. You told investigators that the wor those words were not your words, but you mm -hmm. copied and pasted them from a message sent by a Washington Post reporter. So yeah. why did you pass this along to Cuomo staffers? Um because I was in the kitchen cabinet that was advising him. And so I wanted them to be aware of what reporters were saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything you would have done differently? And I'm wondering this because, again, because of your liberal social, liberal on social issues um, reputation, what do you say to the folks who say, Ask the question, how could you do that? How could you defend him um, against these, these accusations? And why shouldn't folks view you as a hypocrite for doing what you did? Right, you know, and it, sure. And this is, it is a difficult conversation. And it's a conversation I had with um, other, you know, former female advisors of his and um, other female operatives in the Democratic Party after, you know, after this all went down, because I did sort of have to process my role in all of this and how I felt about it. Was I being complicit? Was I helping um, perpetuate uh, bad behavior? You know, certainly bad behavior that any woman in politics, any woman in a male dominated field is familiar with. And because I certainly would not want to be that person. And I guess this is what I would say is I believe women. I believe women deserve the benefit of the doubt. Um, but I also do believe that we need to, I do believe in an element of due process. And that if someone like Governor Cuomo adamantly denies something um, and uh, you know, wants to make a case for him and you know, it's credible to people he trusts, that he does deserve people around him to help him fight charges. Um, as we saw with the Tara Reid example um, against Joe Biden in 2020, um, there were people who sort of knee jerk said, well, I believe all women. I believe Tara Reid. There was no proof to her um, allegations. But those, if we had just said, okay, because Tara Reid said these things, then Joe Biden's done. Um, every, every woman staffer should leave him. Um, 
uh, we should abandon him as a nominee. And it's clear that we need, um, as we're sort of navigating this thorny new post Me Too world, that we do need to understand that while we should believe women, there has to be some sort of um, a, th a threshold here and, mm -hmm. and a willingness to listen to um, listen to the men, um, examine the evidence before we sort of um, you know, bring out the guillotine. And um, it was the Tara Reid moment was with Biden was a really, you know, was sort of a watershed moment there because we had seen previously in politics um, uh, that, you know, a lot of men with just like one or a couple of accusations had you know, dropped out of races, resigned from office. And so it's clear that we need to have yeah. a measured approach when we when we deal with these things. And it was a and it was a big test, I think, Jonathan. In, and I mean, I'd be curious for your thought on this as well. I know you're interviewing me, but as a reporter, um, this must be something that you guys struggle with day to day because allegations come out of the woodwork. Um, against you know men, against women, um, all the time, and and what is the threshold when you're vetting? How do you cover it? Because you also know that there's a dynamic that an accusation ends up on page one, the clarification or the the right. withdrawal of the accusation ends up on page twenty seven, and that means that someone's life, someone's reputation is forever, ever tarnished by that accusation. And so it's something I grapple with as an operative, but I would be curious, I don't mean to turn it back on you, but um, I, <laughs> it's a, it is a fascinating conversation and it's right. one I have, I think would be interesting for people to hear is how you as a journalist deal with it because it is a really, really tough thing that we are now having to grapple with on both sides. Well, the good, th the good thing about being an opinion writer is that we're not under the pressure of the day to day let's get a quote let's get a let's get a story which gives us time to take a step back and do our own reporting and do our own gut check i think just as i can tell you um from being an opinion writer and a, and an editorial writer that especially accusations like that we take those very seriously we hang back we look at the news coverage we do our own reporting and then decide whether we're going to write about, does this rise to the level of writing about it on, on the editorial page or not? And once there is a clarification, we feel duty bound to come back to it. So editorials don't show up on page one, but they show up, uh, you know, we, we do a clarification editorial, like we told you about this, new evidence has come out, this is the way it is. Um, we feel duty bound to do that. You know, Liz, you and I are sitting here talking, and the t the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking <laughs> by, and I there's so much to get to know, um, in your book any given Tuesday. But I have to get to one more one more painful um, moment uh, in your personal and professional life before we yeah. get to the nitty gritty of of today's politics. Your relationship with then New York Governor, married New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. You write in the book. Um, you were the subject of tabloid headlines during and after your relationship with Spitzer. You described this time as painful. And when you're the subject of, of New York tabloid headlines, there's no other word for it. What was the most painful thing to write when you sat down to write the book? Um, so one point of clarification um, is, you know, he was he was separated from his wife. He was living separated from his wife at the time. Um, so that's just an important okay. thing I, I want to lay out before before we get started. That you know that was painful to write about, um, but probably not as painful as some of the other things I, I wrote about. Um, you know, writing about the Cuomo stuff was very painful. Writing about the Pete stuff was oddly very emotional for me um, because the campaign had touched me so much, but. Let me get to the, I, your question was about the relationship, my relationship with Elliot and sort of what I took from it. And God, as you can imagine, breakups suck. Um, public breakups suck even more. And mm -hmm. writing about public breakups suck the most. Um, so none of that was fun to me because um, a few things. I try to be very honest in this book. Um, and advice I got when I was writing this book was to be, the most important thing is to be honest, is to 
this up there also is to pull no punches, um, to be willing to light other self, other people on fire and to be w willing to light yourself on fire. Um, and I, I think I, you know, I think I met all those, all those sort of, um, all those sort of guidelines, but, um, it was also important to me that like my relationship had been splashed all over the tabloids and I write about the false things that had been written about my relationship. And it was really, really hurtful. Um, not just for me to read, uh, these you know, false, disgusting things written about me. And I was, you know, called every misogynist term, um, that you could imagine in the New York Post, as the New York Post is wont to do. Um, but it was really, really hard revisiting um, some of the personal fallout I had around the relationship. Um, and that's, I think, what shaped why I sort of ran, why I sort of run to people in crisis rather than run away from them. Because there was a period where I lost friends. I lost people who had been my friends close friends for two years who um, didn't want to be associated with me anymore, didn't want to have me at their parties, didn't want um, anything to do with me because I was seen as radioactive. Why? All because I had fallen in love um, and uh, fallen in love with someone and the incoming mayor of New York decided that um, you know, I, that because of that relationship, I didn't deserve to work for him anymore. That was the only reason why I was fired. Um, so th there was losing friends, but there was also an alienation thing that happened with my family. Um, mm. my family is not in this world at all. Um, they are private people. They're success, very successful people, but they live pretty normal, pretty, um, stayed lives. My three siblings all have multiple children. My parents were married for 50 something years. Years. Um, they, you know, my dad had been a successful lawyer and had been written about, um, you know, leading his firm after 9-11 and things like that. But they certainly had never been in the New York Post before. <laughs> um, and they had never experienced what it was like when I went to, the, to, to my parents' home for Christmas. And I pull up to Christmas Day and there are, no joke, 10 photographers outside of my parents' um driveway and so my nieces and nephews are running around wondering like what the heck is going on are, are we in a movie is aunt liz famous and they were too young to really understand what was going on but it was horrifying it was horrifying for my family the next day to see you know their house on the cover of the new york post and the daily news and it was embarrassing i think for them um to have to go into work and face questions about this and there were a few days there where they were you know the relationships the relations between us were very strained and i had been relying them on them for a lot of emotional support so it was really hard to revisit that because it was a period of time um of immense isolation in my life. Um, and I talk about it, it caused paralyzing, paralyzing anxiety for me, insomnia. Um, but it did teach me sort of how to deal with crises and how to get through them. And most importantly, that you can get through them, that mm -hmm. what feels like the end of the world in, in one or two days, like in two days, no one will remember. And in campaigns, you do have this feeling sometimes when there's a really bad story on the cover of the Washington Post that like, oh my God, the world is ending. No one's going to support me anymore. Should we drop out? And then all the younger staffers are freaking out. And I can be a voice of sort of <laughs> calm and most people <laughs> associate me with calm and, and whatever, but I can be a source of calm and reason. And especially with candidates to say, to sit them aside and talk to them and tell them this is what it this is what the first few days are going to be like and this is how you're going to get through it and I am going to help you get through it and I'll hold your hand I'll be there for you I'll be there for your spouse for any of those conversations that you want to have and as painful as it was it was helpful in that in that sense um one more question before we turn to 2022. I mean, 20. wow, you are really getting deep here, Jonathan. You, this feels well, like, I feel like, I feel like this is like an Oprah interview or something. Well, I mean, you know, why have all this time if you're not going to, you know, really get in, get in there and have a real conversation? So I like it. No, I like it. I like it. It's good. I yeah. just, I, it's, it's, and I'm just so, it's, it's refreshing because 
I'm so used to, as you said at the beginning, we're so used to having like five minute cable conversations that, um, <laughs> that it's nice, but it's, yeah, I'm, um, as I do in the book, so, I, I, it's refreshing. It feels good to share this much. So then I want, so I want you to share a, a, a little more. Um, the biggest lesson you learned from that, from your time with um, Elliot Spitzer, who I, I used to know back in my days in New York, um, lesson learned. Um, yeah, the biggest lesson you learned. Um, again, I, I think the biggest lesson I learned is one is important one, which is that it's important for me to keep my private life private, um, that I am, you know, I have this book out now, but prior to having this book out, I was a behind the scenes person. And when you're a behind the scenes person and an advisor, you never want to be the story. You never want to be part of the story. And this did make me part of the story. And uh, it affected my ability, certainly to get hired for um, jobs going forward. I think, you know, over time that sort of went away, but I was seen as a little bit radioactive or whatever you want to call it, a little bit controversial because of that relationship choice. And that's something that everyone should think about. Um, as much as it sucks to have to be calculating about your personal life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and another lesson I learned is, you know, probably a lesson that I learned with Andrew Cuomo, which is that there are, uh, along the way, either before you start working for someone, before you start dating someone, there are red flags, there are alarm bells, and you should probably pay attention to them. And, you know, sometimes you like to say, well, love is love, and you go where you, you know, you go with where your heart is. But um, I think we all know it's, as we get older, it's not as complicated, it's not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I should have, um, maybe thought through more who I was dating, um, you know, what his past had been and how it would affect me going forward, because it's not like dating me would affect his, his reputation going forward. You know, um, he had already, um, done as much as he could to shape his reputation himself. But it did have an outsized influence in my reputation. And, and I understand that, you know, the day I die in my obituary, that he'll probably be a line of that. And is it worth it? Um, probably not. And so, I, I, again, it goes back to the Cuomo thing is the importance of, of thinking things through and, um, you know, not just sort of going with. Mm -hmm. your heart on some of these things and thinking through what it's going to mean for you, your reputation and your life going forward. Have you spoken to Elliot Spitzer since the everything? Um, God, I haven't spoken to him in years, in years. Um, I wish him the best. Um, we went through such a turbulent relationship together, turbulent mostly in terms of how it was covered, um, uh, you know, it's so bizarre when when you open the New York Post and it feels like you're reading about a fictional character. You're reading about a fictional relationship. And, and um, so many assumptions were made about what our, our life was like. And a lot of it was a very normal relationship, but, um, you know, it, I think it was very important for our, for both of us to sort of move on, cut cords. And, um, I, I wish, I'd certainly wish him the best. I think that he is living his best life now, um, being a real estate developer and all of that. But in relationships, it's oftentimes important to like have a clean break and move forward. And that's what we did. But I do, I do wish him the best and I wish his family the best. I got to know his daughters and all of that. And I wish them all the best. And have you um, spoken to uh, Andrew Cuomo since all of that? Um, I haven't spoken to him since last year. So um, since, you know, the fallout of the AG report. Right. All right. Let's talk about uh, 2022, 2024. And I'm going to kick off this part of the conversation with an audience question. Um, this comes from Kelly Johnson from Washington. Will anyone primary Biden, President Biden? So I'm going to, I'm going to keep this short because I know I've been sort of not filibustering, but trying to answer your questions well, thoughtfully, yeah. answering your 
question thoughtfully. Um, no, I no, I do not think anyone will primary Biden. Um, there's whispers of it to the extent that we do hear whispers of it. Um, it's coming largely, you know, from the media who, um, you know, it's in the, the media likes to sort of present opportunities, things that could happen and from the left. And I interpret the whisperings from the left to sort of be um, a bargaining tactic, right? To sort of say, we might get a primary from the left so that maybe he capitulates to the left more on um, some of the, their priorities. Yeah, and and do you think that's going to work? <laughs> I should not have had a sip of coffee before you asked that. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it will work. Um, and Joe Biden was elected to be sort of like a consensus candidate, someone who could really appeal to all Americans. And um, he's really best when he is who he is, which is pretty middle of the road guy, um, a consensus builder. And it's really tough to be a consensus builder in Washington right now when you have a Republican Party that is determined, much as the Republican Party was with Barack Obama, to make Joe Biden a one term president. But um, it's we've seen him stand up to the left. And I think he's got to do a little bit more of that to show some strength. Um, because they have sort of, you know, gone, you know, drawn some blood for him. But I do not see them getting a lot of wins from him. No. So let's talk about, you know, they're also, you know, well, one, the president's poll numbers are abysmal. How much of a drag will that be on um, Democrats up and down the ballot around the country, particularly in the House? Yeah, well, traditionally, we know that the president's approval numbers in the midterms correlate very, very closely with um, how uh, his, I was going to say his or her, but it's only his in our history, with how his party performs. But we are seeing this bizarre dynamic this year, Jonathan. And it's the first time that we've really seen it where um, his numbers keep going down, but in the generic ballot yes. the Democrats have kept going up and right. I've never I've never seen this dynamic before and I think it, and I'd be curious for what your thoughts on are on it but my thoughts on it are this is that people are, are expressing their frustration with you know with life right now and putting it all on Joe Biden right we have still the fallout of the pandemic um, we have inflation Gas prices, which have been falling um, and uh, con hopefully will continue to fall, but are still too high and causing a lot of pain. But you also have this other dynamic, right? Um, you had the Dobbs decision, which uh, which I think has really reframed the stakes of the election for a lot of people. You've had these horrific, horrific mass shootings, which... <clears throat> um, have been extremely tragic, but important in that they've seemed to have more staying power with the American people than mass shootings have in recent times. Like after the after fifty something people were slaughtered in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, it, it was almost like that fell off the front covers, the front covers of newspapers within a week, which is almost unbelievable. But now, you know, a month on, we are still having very intense conversations about Uvalde um, and the other mass shootings that we've seen recently in Buffalo, um, different circumstances, um, but both heartbreaking and horrific. And um, as a Democrat, I am, uh, I'm glad that, you know, maybe some good can come out of this, which could be a, a renewed focus on gun reform. So I think that it has to do with the decoupling here, which is that people are frustrated with general things. They're taking that out on the president, but they understand that the stakes of this election are high. And it, the Republicans have done themselves no favors by nominating in key election after key election um, the most extreme candidates. You know, ca candidates who are like Trump on steroids. And this mm -hmm. is in both Senate and gubernatorial um, elections. And the governor's races are, are really fascinating because you, generally they don't get as much attention nationally. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about um, governor's races because my background is more governor's race heavy. And I talk about why I personally gravitated to them because 
I think governors have a lot more power than U.S. senators. Um, we know when you're the governor, you have, you know, you have a, you manage a state bureaucracy of tens of thousands of people. You have a $200 billion budget. Whereas when you're, you know, the senator from New York, you have a staff of, of dozens and, you know, you're just one of a hundred votes in the Senate. But governor's races are going to be really important now because the Dobbs decision has, has really thrown the abortion issue back to the state. Mm -hmm. And so if, um, if let's, Let's take a look at a few of these governors. Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. Um, we don't net yet know who's going to be in Michigan, but all of the, the main candidates are um, uh, opposed abortion in all instances. Um, same in, in Wisconsin. And also in all three of these states, the likely, either the nominee and Doug Mastriano, he's someone who was at January 6th. He bust people there. He tried to invalidate the 2020 results. In um, Wisconsin, the likely nominee was someone who had the FBI raid his home for his role in July 6th. And not only that, he's using that as a selling point with Republican voters. Like, what a twisted world we live in, right? Because in any other right. on any other planet, having your house raided by the FBI would disqualify you. And now right. he is most likely to do that. Same in Wisconsin. So now if we elect these people governor in these states, they will push to um, outlaw abortion on day one. No exceptions. And we know that they will do everything in their power to make sure that we don't have free and fair elections in those states. And so the stakes are really high. And I think that is why you see that decoupling. Okay, so I'm glad you brought up governor's races. And yeah, the most extreme folks are, are winning these primary nominations. But Liz, some of these folks are winning these, these, you know, fringe folks, formerly fringe folks on the right are winning Republican nominations because Democratic voters are voting uh, in those primaries to make sure that that person is the nominee. But I wonder, do you fear, am I being alarmist in thinking that Democrats are playing with fire when they do that? Um, you're not being alarmist. Um, it is a valid concern. And it is, this is something I've, I've talked with my friends with, you know, in politics because I grapple with it myself, right? I do think people, remember in 2016, the Hillary Clinton campaign talked about the Pied Piper strategy, right? Which is that they were going to do things to help Donald Trump. Donald Trump was going to win that primary regardless. And, you know, from pretty much the second he came down the elevator to the <laughs> second that Ted, Ted Cruz is the last person to drop out, he led those polls. Um, and I, it is my belief that, you know, the that these ads that some Democratic groups have run that, um, you know, that some of that sort of trickery, whatever you want to call it, has been a little bit overblown um, and that these candidates would win these primaries no matter what, because they represent where the Republican base is. And, you know, it is a sad reality that, well, sad to me, not obviously not sad to someone who's a uh, Trumper, that the Republican base really, really has been, um, you know, hijacked by a strain of Trumpism. And I think that without, even without the Democrats' help, that these people would be the nominees regardless. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but now that they're the nominees, do they survive a general election? Because that's the gamble. That's the bet Democrats are making, that these folks won't survive the general. Right. And um, in just to do it, I'm, I'm going to do it very quickly. But a quick history thing was in 2012, I worked for Claire McCaskill in 2006. I was a press secretary on her campaign. Um, and that was a big year. She, she won. She beat uh, Jim Talent that year. In 2012, she had a really, really tough reelection. That was when Missouri was shifting so far to the right. You know, now Missouri is, which used to be a swing state, is to the right of states like Mississippi. So in mm. 2012, she took a gamble. She put her personal money in to help Todd Aiken win the Republican primary. And then, you know, Todd Aiken went out and made horrific comments about, um, uh, about women, um, women being raped and how they couldn't he get pregnant. He was a pregnant. legitimate rape guy. Right. Exactly, a Legi yeah. legitimate right guy. And that no doubt helped her win. Um, but now we are seeing 
we're seeing sort of that weird dance that we saw with Roy Moore a few years ago where the National mm -hmm. Republican Party pulled back a little bit after it turned out that he had had, you know, inappropriate, um, you know, it was accused of misconduct with, um, you know, numerous teenage girls. Um, and we've seen the head of the Republican Governors Association take a step back and say that he's um, not necessarily going to support people like Doug Mastriano. Um, and we've seen governors like uh, like Sununu in in New Hampshire, who's New Hampshire, sort of seen yeah. as as a moderate there, call Mastri he, on TV last week. I heard him call people like Mastriano um, and Kari Lake in Arizona. I think he actually called them crazy. So we'll see. Now th that might be a cynical thing they're doing right now for branding purposes because they don't want to be seen as you know backing these people who literally you know, either storm the Capitol or were at the Capitol on January 6th. And they know that it is really bad for the Republican brand to be um, sort of associated with people who believe in a complete ban on abortion. But um, we have seen that Republicans will really do anything that th that it takes to win. And they right. did end up going back in to support Roy Moore at the end of that race. So if right. these races are close, I do suspect that the Republicans who are, you know, trying to be all high and mighty right now will somehow, you know, find a few million dollars to slip into um, you know, those, <laughs> those, those, those Pennsylvania media uh -huh. markets. All right, we've got we we've got five minutes left, but I'm just going to alert folks. We will probably go over just a little bit, but I need to get you on a few lightning round questions. One, okay. does does Donald Trump actually announce that he's running for president of the United States for 2024? Yes. Oh, okay. Who who's going to beat him for the, for the uh, Republican uh, uh, nomination? Then, um, I would so I would say right now. No one, but th th this is a scenario where I could see someone beating him. We know that um, tomorrow night is uh, the final night of the January 6th hearings, and they are going to try to, well, they might, they said there might be more, that they're going to try to draw a direct line between Donald Trump and um, what happened on January 6th and provide the most concrete proof. Um, and I, the Republicans have been noticeably silent on everything that's come out in January 6th. And the only dynamic that I could see stopping him is if, you know, all the Republican elites, you know, all those billionaire super PAC donors who, um, you know, shovel gazillions of dollars into these races, um, and all the, you know, top U.S. senators, top leaders in the House, top governors, you know, the what's left of the senior states people in the Republican Party sort of convene and say, you know what, this has gone too far. We cannot nominate this guy because as, you know, as low as Biden's numbers might be right now, he could lose to Joe Biden and he could destroy the modern Republican mm -hmm. Party. But it will take a really, really unified front. Um, and I'm not I'm not positive that there are enough Republicans with backbone to do that. I think that the Republican Party is terrified of Donald Trump, but not just of Donald Trump, but of the sort of um, the underbelly that he's right. really um, uh, unleashed in the Republican Party. And we all knew to some extent that that underbelly was there. There was always this very uncomfortable relationship between the, you know, acceptable seeming country club Republicans. But we all knew that there was that, as my friend Tim Miller has a best selling book out um, called Why I Did It that I recommend everyone read. Um, but we knew that there was an element of the Republican Party that was fueled by what he calls this rage juice, fueled by mm. hate. Fueled by every ugly ism you could talk about, sexism, racism, you know, xenophobia, all of that. And Trump took them from sort of being, you know, the voters that the country club Republicans knew would always turn out for them, but never wanted to talk about. He and he made them now the the face of the Republican Party. Yeah, and so yeah. I don't know if you can put that genie back in the bottle. Right. And as I always keep um, telling people in print and, and on television and anyone who will listen, doesn't matter if Donald Trump runs for president again in 2024. It's Trumpism that is still uh, uh, about in the land. And Liz, we, we are now officially over time. But I, I, the last question is this. If President Biden doesn't does not run 
for re-election. Would you advise your former client, Secretary Pete, to primary Vice President Harris? Um, I am I am I am going to take the fifth on that. I'm gonna take the fifth on it. <laughs> Please okay. allow me to be because look, I've been honest with you about everything, um, but because I know that anything I say here will be used against me. Um, and um, maybe not in a court of law, but in the court of public opinion and will be used against Pete. What I will say is this, I have not had any conversations with Pete about 2024. I do not know. Look, he, like me, believes that Joe Biden is gonna run. He is gonna do everything in his power to help Joe Biden run um, and win. And I think he's been an, an extremely effective surrogate for him. But, um, you know, if Joe Biden were to choose not to run, we can have that conversation then. But um, I know that we do have a big, vibrant Democratic Party, a great bench, and we've just got to help continue to build people up. But um, I appreciate you letting me um, uh, invoke the Fifth okay. Amendment. For, for, and it's funny that you asked me all these deeply probing questions and, you know, got me a little, you know, got me a little emotional. But that's where I, that's where I draw the line. Pete. Right. You took the fifth on that. Uh, of all the questions, you took the fifth on that question. We didn't even get a chance to talk about that that deep bench uh, that you mentioned, one you're working for, Mallory McMorrow, yeah. Michigan state senator, who is a is a a, a a talent. But we don't have any time. So Liz right. Smith, Democratic strategist and author of Any Given Tuesday. Thank you so much for coming to this subscriber exclusive edition of Capehart on Washington Post Live. Great, and thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. That was a really fun, really deep conversation. And um, I and thank you so much to the Washington Post Live for doing this because it's not a lot of times that we get to have conversations where we really get in depth like this and it, it's, it's, it's good for people to hear them and get to hear us but beyond you know five minute segments where you just hear one minute um, sound bites. So I, I, I wanna extend my thank you to the entire Washington Post community as well. Thank you, we, we, okay. we all appreciate that. Liz Smith, have a great day. Yes, you too. And thank you for joining us. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Washington Post Live.